This is really a fantastic talks uh, thus far. Um, these are my disclosures. When, when we're approaching patients with spinal metastases, we have to consider which factors to, to consider. Uh, and Dan did a nice job talking about some of those factors. I would argue that the, the issues, the variables that you need to consider in spinal metastases are actually much more variable and more complex uh, than in primary disease. Case in point, if you, if you can imagine a, say, a 52-year-old uh, woman with chondrosarcoma, grade 2 chondrosarcoma of the spine, if we went around the room and started to talk, how would you manage that? Most people would, would eventually come down to, gee, the person probably needs surgery, and you'd try to get negative margins. Probably wouldn't give chemotherapy because there aren't any proven uh, chemotherapeutic agents for chondrosarcoma. You probably wouldn't give radiation unless you flew to Boston, and then you would get radiation. Um, but you know, generally speaking, you, you, would, you would settle on surgery. Now take that same person, a woman, 52, and she has a solitary breast cancer. We would probably have a lot of discussion because there's a lot, there are a lot more variables. How do you manage this? Teratactic radiosurgery, resection, chemotherapy. What's the subtype of breast cancer? It's a more complex area. There, there are a lot more judgments that you have to make in these patients. One of the judgments you have to think about is, is survival. Should we be predicting survival? And of course, it's the topic of my, of my talk, so I, I think you should, be able, you should be trying to predict it. And can we predict it? And I'll, I'll talk a lot about that dur during uh, my presentation. And Dan talked about this, the gnomes criteria, and I won't belabor this too much. I like the gnomes. I like all these, these uh, uh, groupings because it helps me, because uh, perhaps I'm simple. I need help organizing my thoughts, and, and these help organize my thoughts. Okay, I don't want to forget about the neurologic issues, the oncologic issues. These are really 10,000-foot level, right? There's a whole discipline of medicine is medical oncology, and we're, we're, you need to uh, keep in mind these issues. Um, it's complex. Uh, the mechanical issues, the SINs criteria, I won't go into. My talk really focuses on this bottom category, systemic disease. You have to make lots of judgments with regard to this. How well is this patient? Is this patient going to live? How long is this patient going to live? These, there are multiple judgments that have, to, that have to be made before you can make a decision with regard to these patients. <clears throat> So does prognosis matter? And this is, this is uh, data from, from our data set, but there are other uh, data sets that are, that are very similar. If you look at the, the overall survival for patients who have, who have been, had surgery for spinal metastases, more than half the patients have died within a year. And so the question is, where does your, where does your, patient, where does your patient lie on this, on this curve? Are they way over here, uh, you know, a couple of years down the road, or are they six weeks, eight weeks into uh, their post-operative recovery? I mean, I, you know, is, does this matter? Well, ask yourself, if you have stage four cancer and, and you have a spinal metastases that may be operative, you want to know where you lie on this, right? You want to know how long you have to live. It'll, it'll influ impact what you agree to as a patient. And to the point that was made earlier, these types of decisions Patients will be involved with these decisions as we go forward. But classically, that's not the case, but I think that that's all going to change. So I would argue prognosis matters quite a bit. Again, uh, and I, I, uh, I refer to Dan quite a bit because he's written so much in, in this area that, that uh, I, could write a, I could do a talk just on Dan's uh, data. But <laughs> this is also Dan's data looking at, at metastatic lung cancer. Right, and so uh, you know, metastatic lung cancer is, is aggressive, and patients don't live very long. In their series, the median survival was, was three months. And so you know, uh, Dean Choi published a paper, and, and he's quoted, as, surgery should not be performed if life expectancy is less than three months. Well, you know, so from a boardroom, if you're making healthcare policy, and you say, that's right, no surgery if they're not going to live for less than, you know, not to live over three months. But when you're seeing a patient, and that patient's in front of you, you make very different decisions. And, and it's very hard to know how long a patient's going to live. What if your patient is down here on the curve and they're living, you know, nine months? Is that, is that okay to operate on that patient? This, it's very, very difficult. I would say that it's important for us to try to figure out how long these patients are going to live and try to give them the best care, but it's not always easy. <clears throat> so if it does matter, and, and I, I've argued that it does matter, how, how well do we predict survival? There was a nice study done uh, out of Sloan Kettering, and this was done by the orthopedic oncologist, one of my mentors, Patrick Boland. And what they did was they prospectively looked at 191 patients who had metastatic uh, bone disease, and they, they had Patrick uh, predict their survival. And then they followed the patients to see how long they actually lived. And there were several parameters that they, that they discovered that were independently associated with survival. And here they are. These are not really surprising. You'll see these throughout my talk. Um, the cancer type, uh, 
obviously very important. I just showed you how lung cancer influences survival. So the cancer type is clearly very important. A performance scale. How, how is this patient in bed all day long? Are they able to, to move around? Are they working? What's their performance score? How many bone, bone metastases? How many visceral metastases? Or do they have uh, visceral metastases? These are just staging issues, right? So all these patients have stage 4 cancer, but they may be at the very early stages of stage 4 cancer versus the late stages. That's very different, and that's going to affect their survival. So many of the criteria that we're going to talk about uh, in, in, uh, today are, are really regarding staging. They also found that hemoglobin level was important. And then the surgeon's estimation of survival, independent, independently, was actually associated with uh, um, how well the patient did. So what they did was they compared them. So they compared them as individ individual entities. They looked at, say, how, how well does hemoglobin by itself predict survival relative to, say, the, the surgeon's perspective? And for the good news for the surgeon, uh, at least for us, is that the, the surgeon's perspective was the best. His estimate was, was the best. And when I say, if you, if you look at, the, at these, uh, this rock curve, if you have, uh, this is the, the reference line here, that's basically like flipping a coin. So you want to be on the left side of that. You want to have the greatest area under the curve. And for this particular study, when you compare each individual parameter, the surgeon's uh, estimate, surgeon's judgment was the best. That's great. But when you look at, at the accuracy of that judgment, so he was right 18% of the time. And they judged that by, by um, if, his, if his estimate of survival was within 20% of the actual survival. He underestimated 43 and, and uh, overestimated 40% of the time. So even in baseball, 18% is not very good, right? So, so it's not a very good estimate. It really, this, this was in a Journal of Clinical Oncology, and some of it was a, a wake-up call. Hey, we're not very good at predicting survival. We all talk about it, but our judgments are, are, not, are not actually that accurate, even with somebody who's had 25 years of experience. You could take a step back and say, all right, fine, well, that's just because he's an orthopedic surgeon, he doesn't know anything about biology, and, and, and that's why they, they didn't get it right. So the question is, is clinical judgment, how, how is clinical judgment? And, and it turns out it's terrible, right? So in fact, human judgment turns out it's not, it's not very good for lots of reasons. But if you compare clinical judgment versus an actuarial judgment, almost always the actuarial judgment is better, or at least as good. And, you know, we think about clinical judgment, and we, we think, well, wait a second, this is a senior, senior doctor, and he's got clinical judgment, we trust him, of course. And they're comparing that to a junior doctor's judgment. And so in that case, clinical judgment is fantastic. It's better than the, than the junior doctor. But if you bring in an actuarial assessment, the actuary beats the senior doctor. The, what, the, adage, the adage that, uh, you know, where does, where does judgment come from? It comes from experience. And where does experience come from? Bad judgment. And, and that's the reality. And that's sort of the mantra of, of our, our whole educational system in, in medicine, which is a bit scary. But uh, there's a lot of literature written about this, not just in medicine, but you can go in, into stocks or whatever you want. Our ability to judge things are not, is not nearly as good as we, we might imagine. And if there is an actuarial assessment around to help you, you should use it. So if you look at the scoring systems, and again, these are the systems that are around that can help you. These have been, uh, they're published, they're utilized. You have the Tokahashi scoring system, which is uh, very popular. That was modified. Why was that modified? Because uh, Professor Tamita from Japan said, look, it's a good system, but you don't emphasize the, the tumor type enough. So Tokahashi modified it. Now it emphasizes the tumor more often. Tamita has his own classification. There's one from the Netherlands, and then Bauer from Scandinavia. He modified that because the original one had pathologic fracture within it, which isn't that applicable in the spine. They modified it, and it's used in the spine. The reason I'm showing you this, look what they include. They all include primary tumor type, the, second, the second, third column over, and they all include visceral metas metastases and most of them number of spinal metastases. So it's the tumor grade, or the tumor, the, uh, tumor type, and then staging in essence, not, not too, too much of a surprise. And there are different ways of, of uh, combining these things. <clears throat> the Tokahashi scoring system, as I said, is very popular. Um, there was an article written about it uh, this past year, which I thought was quite interesting. And it was assessing how well the Tokahashi score uh, predicted survival. And what they found was that the overall accuracy of this scoring system was 63%. And if it was trying to predict how long the patients that would live less than six months, it was accurate about 64% of the time. If they were trying to predict between 6 and 12 months, about 55% of the time. If they're going to live more than a year, that was better, 77% of the time. So these patients are going to live longer than a year. It was reasonable at predicting that. But it wasn't very good at predicting how long people are going to live shorter times, which is really what you want to do, right? That, that's one of the biggest things. How long are these people going to live? Who's going to live four months? The guy that's going to live two years, it's a little bit easier. It becomes more, almost more like a, a primary tumor. <clears throat> 
So it, it, uh, it begs the question, is the Tokahashi scoring system relevant? So what about the modified Bauer score? This is a very popular scoring system, and, it, and it's nice. It's, it's quite simple. There are really four categories. Most of them have to do with tumor type and also staging. So the first are no visceral mets. If you don't have any visceral mets, you get a score of one. Again, a staging issue. If you don't have lung cancer, right? They, they read Dan's paper before it was even published. If you don't have lung cancer, you get, you get, a, you get, a, you get a one. And then if you have a tumor type that has a more favorable prognosis, again, two of the four categories have to do with the tumor, um, you get a point. And then again, another staging issue, solitary skeletal, skeletal metastases. So a total of four points. And then they created this class, what I would call a classic scoring system. And if you look for the, the patients who have a, a poor prognosis, score of zero to one, they have their median survival, 4.8 months, score of two, 18, and you can see three to four, you get 28 months. The, the problem I have with classic scoring systems, now there are lots of problems I have with them, but one of them is, so you can go from a score of one, move up to a score of two, and look at the range. So all of a sudden, you, you're telling somebody you have 4.8 months to live, but now you have 18.2 months to live. I, somewhere in between is where this patient is, and how do you use that in, in, your, in your assessment? I don't think these scoring systems should be used to decide, I'm gonna do this surgery, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this clinical decision. It's a judgment. It helps you make a judgment, and you make multiple judgments before we operate. You don't use these as, as a, an actual decision-making tree. And I don't find this personally all that useful, although, although other people disagree with me. So uh, Mitch Harris is a good friend of mine, a mentor. Um, they they uh, actually developed a, another scoring system, which, which has been a nice scoring system. It also looks at complications, not just survival, and so it's useful in that way. And, and they, it's, it's very parsimonious. So they have, four, they have three categories. They, have an, they, they look at albumin. If you have a uh, albumin over 3.5 or less than 3.5, you get a point or no point. If you have a modified Bauer score of three or four, you get two points. If it's less than that, you get zero points. And then your ambulatory status. Do you have normal ambulation or impairment of any kind? You get one point or no points, right? So very parsimonious. And then they have this classic scoring system. And it's nice. But again, I think it suffers from the same issues that I, that I mentioned to you earlier. I, I, don't, I think it's oversimplifying um, uh, these patients. So we decided to develop our, our own scoring system uh, with, with data from, from Mass General and also from uh, Brigham Women's Hospital. And so we looked at 649 patients. So it's, it's, a, it's a large data set, except when you start talking about genomics, where, where you know, it, this is not very big. But still, a decent data set to, to, uh, to look at. And we looked at uh, patients who, who underwent surgery for spinal metastases. We're backing up, and we're looking at all of our patients who have spinal metastases, which is a much, much larger set. Most patients don't get surgery, as we know. But right now, all these patients had surgery. We excluded patients who had a revision or if they had a cement augmentation. And our primary outcome was, was overall survival. And we used a multivariate Cox uh, um, hazard model to assess this. Just some of our baseline data, not surprising, right? The age, average age is 60. Um, more men than women. And primary tumor type, 18%, right? So median survival, as Dan pointed out, three months. We're operating a lot of those patients. Should we be operating them or not? That, we'll have to talk about that. So the, the uh, Cox proportional hazards model uh, identified multiple factors. I'll just go through them briefly. Age. Age has been shown in lots of different scoring systems to be relevant, right? The, the, the older patients don't do as well as the younger patients for a variety of reasons, higher complications. ECOG performance scale, I've already talked about that a bit. That's important. Is the patient bed bound or not? Primary tumor type, very, very important. And then a lot of these are staging issues. How many spinal metastases do they have? Do they have visceral metastases? Again, similar to what's been shown before. Prior systemic therapy. Now, why, why do we have that in there? Well, if somebody comes in and they, they have stage four cancer and they just got diagnosed a week ago, the pro there's a probability, that there's a more likely probability that they're going to respond to chemotherapy if they've ever seen it than somebody who's already had a lot of chemotherapy. They're, they're closer to the end of, of what, what they're going to tolerate. They've, the chemotherapy has already killed most of the cancer cells it's going to kill, and it's selected out for the more aggressive cancer type. So this is, again, a staging issue. And then we found white blood cell count and hemoglobin also to be important. And we did what everybody else did initially, and that was create a classic scoring system. Based on the, hazards, the hazard ratio, we, we assigned a score, came up with a scoring system, looks very similar to the other ones that have been published, and we thought that was OK, but not great. Could we improve upon it? So we decided to create a, a nomogram. And just going to go through this nomogram very briefly. This has the parameters that came out on, on our, our uh, um, our Cox model. So if you look at hemoglobin, if you have a hemoglobin of 10, um, you just drop down to the point score, it's 68 points. 
If you have a white blood cell count of four, you drop down and you're tallying this up, okay? <clears throat> Age is a factor, you get 48 points. This is all weighted uh, beta, uh, based on what's called the beta coefficient. Um, whether they had systemic therapy or not, this patient didn't, they get no points. This patient has brain metastases, they get 72 points, more score is worse, worse survival. <clears throat> they have more than one mobile spine metastases. In this case, uh, this person didn't. Again, it's a staging issue. Primary tumor type, this person had lung cancer. That's a, that's a worse score, 59 points. And then their ECOG score. This person actually had a good performance score, no points. So total points, 300. Okay, fine. So what do you do? Now you drop this down to, to your probability area. You go to 300 points, drop it down. Your 30-day probability of survival, somewhere around 86%. Your 90-day probability survival is somewhere around 62%, and your one-year probability survival is about 28%. Now, again, you're not making a, uh, you're not letting this decide for you what you're going to do for this patient. It's a factor. It, it is a is a factor that you can use to make a clinical judgment. You you compile your clinical judgments together and make a clinical decision. I find this more useful than, than uh, the, the uh, other scoring systems. Now, I talked to one of my co-authors on this, on this project, Mitch Harris, and he said, you know, nobody's ever going to use this. Nobody's ever going to use this nomogram because nomograms are, are too difficult to use. And I said, you know, my second grader can do it. If you get it, give him a ruler, he, can, he goes, yeah, okay, but nobody's going to do it. So, and I, I said, you know, maybe he's right. It's, you know, people are going to look this up. They've got to they print it out. Maybe they won't do it. So Dan and I are actually going to, uh, we're designing a, a, uh, an app. We're going to make an app for this. And, and uh, the, the more we've thought about it, I think the, the more important it is to have an app. Not because it, it's, it's accessible. Of course, that is part of the reason. But because we, we then can adapt it. So if we only use the printed version of it, People will go back to the printed version and use it. If with the app, it will, it will have to adapt. This is still a very blunt instrument. These, these, the weights on these individual factors will likely change over time as, as our treatment changes. <clears throat> and in fact, some of these factors may, may drop out or we may gain other factors. So it's a dynamic area. It's just not a static part of it. That Tokahashi scoring system or that Tokahashi paper that I showed you was uh, uh, illustrated that issue. So I think, you know, the, the nomogram, we've actually done this for extremity metastases as well. We're, we're developing other nomograms to help with clinical decision making. They're just, they're, they're helping you actually with a judgment so you can make a clinical decision. <clears throat> so... We, we have also set out to validate this. Dan has, has uh, validated it in his, in his uh, patient population. We work with Mark Bilski uh, from Sloan Kettering, and, and they've also validated it. And so what we did here, we looked at 100 patients from Sloan Kettering, and we tried to see, was our model predictive in their patients? You might argue that, gee, wait a second, you know, Boston and New York, that's really the same patient population, so maybe you ought to go to Asia or... Uh, somewhere else, and, and that's where we're going to try to do that. But right now, this was the, the preliminarily, we, we tried to validate this from patients from Sloan Kettering. But not just validate it, we wanted to compare it to the other systems that are out there, the Tokahashi, Tomita, the Bauer scoring system, and the, the Gori, or the one, uh, this is Mitch Harris's group. And so what we found was that the, at three months, and one of the other issues with the, with the other scoring systems that are out there is they don't tell you, they, you can't predict anything less than six months. The category is six months or less, which again, I think is, is, not, is not precise enough. So the only one that we could really compare to at this level was the Tokahashi scoring system, and, and, and the, um, uh, our nomogram was, was better at predicting th uh, three months survival. What about one year survival? And again, you know, perhaps this is less meaningful, but at the one year survival mark, um, our system, the area under the curve was greater than, than all the other uh, scoring systems. And so we feel like that this is a, a good start. It's certainly not a finish. I think that, that um, our hope is, as I say, this will be dynamic and certainly is going to change. It would be great to have something like a, a genetic data um, uh, you know, involved with this so, so patients can, uh, we can make a, a much more accurate prediction model. But this, I think, is, 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 a, is a reasonable start. So in conclusion, there are actuarial systems out there. I think that they're superior to clinical judgment. I, I don't think so that, that's been shown in, in the literature. Um, I think that you have to remember that these are not making clinical decisions for you. They help you make a judgment. You compile your judgments to make a clinical decision. Thank you. <clears throat>